So we're going to talk about a report that we do every year that's called The Anatomy of an API. Uh, and this is our actually our second edition. So we started last year, 2023. Uh, and we're going to give you a rundown uh, of what it is. So Harsh is going to be my clicker because our clicker doesn't work, whatever. Uh, so we're going to give you a short intro about uh, me and Harsha. I'm going to do myself and then Harsha. Maybe we should have done it reversed, but doesn't matter. So hi, my name is Vendra and I'm the founder and CEO of Treble. Uh, I'm an, basically, I'm an engineer, been an engineer most of my life. Um, I think I built over 100 APIs and then I realized there's like the same set of problems on every single API, just a different set of faces every time you build one. So that's what, what we ended up kind of deciding to build. And uh, here, I'll let Harsha say a couple of words uh, on himself. Sure. Thanks, Vadran. Uh, before I give an intro, maybe folks on the back, maybe you want to come out front. Sorry to call you out. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm Harsha. Definitely did not build hundreds of APIs, uh, but uh, a few. Uh, I'm an engineer as well, uh, but been in the API business for a few years now. Uh, I work in the customer team at Treble uh, by helping individual developers teams and organizations uh, with their APIs and their API programs. Cool. Thank you, Harsha. So we're going to just a couple of words about us uh, and why. Uh, then you'll probably realize why, where we get the data, how, why, why it's relevant and everything else. So at Treble, we like, to, uh, we like to say that we help organizations figure out their APIs. We've got this suite of products, uh, everything from observability, security, governance, compliance, AI, cataloging, basically everything you need uh, uh, except the gateway to, uh, to run uh, everything you're doing on the API. Uh, everything is completely automated and super easy to use. Uh, you can basically get started on an, any API in the world just by dropping in uh, on SDK uh, through a code integration or actually a gateway integration with our partners like uh, Traffic Labs and, and their amazing new gateway. Now, we essentially cover everything when it comes to the API lifecycle except the gateway part itself. So you can get everything from automatically generated documentation to developer portals, to observability, to governance, everything uh, in one spot. Let's go. Uh, when it comes to kind of some of the traction metrics that we've got, we since we, we were founded in 2021, since then, we've got about 150,000 developers. We process roughly about 2.4 billion API requests per month across, give or take, 15,000 different APIs. And we track about half, uh, half a million uh, different endpoints. And this is going to be very important for the thing that we're essentially talking about. So uh, besides that, we, uh, just like many of you here, probably know our friends at Gartner, IDC, and all of those. Well, they also written, written about us extensively, so you can uh, get that research there and get, get a better feel for your product. Also, we just got, uh, from, got back from Santa Clara where we won an award for best in API observability. Uh, and with that in mind, we can kinda, I can give you a lowdown of how this got started. So as you know, there's like a lot of surveys out there about APIs uh, and a lot of data about how people might be building APIs. But as somebody who's integrated a lot of APIs from third party engineers and like random companies, I kind of saw that that, you know, the reality doesn't exactly match what's reported. So we wanted to start understanding how are actually people building these APIs, what technologies they use, you know, what are some of the relevant data points there. And that's where we started essentially tracking uh, all of this data through our product. Again, we basically sampled 1 billion API requests, 15,000 APIs, about half, uh, half a million uh, endpoints. And we essentially crunched all that data to try to answer a question like, how do people actually build APIs? And what we've been able to do for the first time, given that we started last year, is we can actually track pro pro progress, right? So we have the same data set as uh, last year. We usually expand it. But basically, the key elements are there. So I, we can actually say, this improved over last year or it didn't improve. So this is what we're going to essentially go through. Uh, if we can go to the next one. <laughs> or just throwing harsh a bit. So, so the first one that we're going to talk about is actually uh, something that Harsha has probably more experience than I do. Uh, so he's going to say a couple of words about this one. For sure. Uh, hopefully not the next one, uh, but we'll start with this. 
So the enterprise API landscape is uh, substantial, uh, which is increasing a lot. And this is something that we see growing every single uh, day, in fact, in enterprises where the number of APIs are exploding. We hear a lot of these terminologies. Uh, I'm sure most of you who are from enterprises uh, know these terms. Uh, some people call it explosion. Some people call it sprawl, uh, but different people, uh, different things. What we've understood from the data that we've gathered uh, uh, inside Treble, which is factual, not based on surveys, like we didn't mention, is most enterprise level organizations maintain over 1,000 APIs, uh, and that number is increasingly growing year on year. And how do we categorize an enterprise uh, organization? Uh, this could mean anywhere between uh, 5,000 plus developers uh, in an organization. That's where we categorize these as uh, enterprise organizations. Uh, and these numbers could probably mean different for different people. Uh, but from where we see number of developers are in, in terms of number of employees, uh, that's how we categorize. And we've heard these terms uh, and numbers seen before where one of my favorite things that I've been hearing a lot is uh, the big five uh, players, for example, Amazon, Facebook, uh, uh, they say even, I read a report uh, last week, they say they have 25,000 plus uh, APIs. And one of my favorite, which I've heard, is logistic companies, uh, which are DHL or US Postal Service. I hear they have 40,000 or 50,000 plus APIs. And imagine the number of endpoints in them, which are, which are growing every single day, right? One of the things um, which I hear from our customers uh, very often is uh, API sprawl. And it's, uh, it's also very, uh, complex thing to handle as the number of APIs are growing. And I'd love to hear what Vedran says about this because we went through our own API sprawl. I don't think we can call it a sprawl internally, but we just uh, um, moved to a very new backend technology and we built Trouble 3.0 from scratch, uh, probably from having a couple of APIs to now having maybe tens of APIs. How many do we have? Yeah, we basically ourselves doubled from like maybe five to 10 to like 20 to 30. Yeah. Yeah. So. See there, we and are a team of. We're not an enterprise company. <laughs> we are not even an enterprise company, uh, but we are a team of seven developers who are building APIs, and we double the number of APIs in less than uh, six months or tripled maybe. So that's something to note. Uh, another another one that I hear is uh, from our friends at Telstra, uh, who also gave a quote in this report, which you can uh, read later. Uh, is um, this uh, notion of federated API management that most of you already hear is something that's uh, been seen a lot in enterprises nowadays, which means uh, while enterprises want to give developers the experience that they want and to build the technologies that they want at an individual level, there still needs to be some governance and federation which is centrally looked upon and uh, where people can actually give developers any tools and technologies they can use to really build anything they want, but with some governance and uh, oversight uh, or a federation at a higher level. One thing that maybe uh, we should add here is, you know, we also track the difference between, you know, private uh, or internal APIs and essentially public and partner APIs. And generally speaking, I would say, Basically, you know, in, in, an, in your average organization, anywhere around 70% of those APIs are actually uh, private and, or internal. Maybe like 20% are, are partners. So we've seen partner APIs grow a lot because a lot of companies um, wants to share information with a lot of other companies. And maybe like 5 to 10% in max uh, are, are these public APIs uh, that get actually exposed uh, uh, to, to the end customers. So we can go to the next uh, key finding. Again, we'll, uh, all of this will be uh, available on our website. We'll share the website, but uh, we're just gonna go through the couple of five key findings that we, we were able to find. This one is actually something uh, somewhat uh, controversial, at least maybe not in the enterprise space, but probably I'm gonna be hated by every, most, every second developer or third developer uh, on the street, but essentially, this is something that we noticed last year, but didn't want to kind of highlight it because we had little data. But essentially, JavaScript-based APIs score lower uh, than the average. So we have this product uh, that's you know part of our governance solution where we automatically score an API against industry standards and best practices. 
we've got three categories. Uh, so it's API design, uh, performance, and security. And we give an automated score on every API that uses Treble. The first time you make a request, we make that score. So based on that data, we essentially saw that uh, the average API score here was 57 out of 100. And essentially, JavaScript-based APIs scored only 42 out of 100, which is given that most of them are at 57, considerably, uh, considerably lower, or exactly 26%. Now, unfortunately, the numbers are a bit worse uh, with, uh, I think, Express, uh, which is a fla flavor of JavaScript even being below that, so with a, a score of 38. Uh, but generally, one theme that we've essentially noticed is that you know, anybody building APIs with JavaScript usually isn't that big of an expert as people who are maybe building, uh, uh, you know, APIs using Java, .NET, and these traditional backend languages where you have some structures, you have a default set of rules, you have a pattern to follow. And again, the problem with REST, or not the problem, at the same time, a good thing and a bad thing is that REST essentially isn't a standard, it's just a bunch of guidelines, right? So I can understand those guidelines completely differently. Uh, from everybody here. Uh, one fascinating thing uh, is that essentially Laravel, I don't know how much you follow the PHP ecosystem, but essentially PHP is still alive as a language and one of the frameworks driving that is Laravel. Our actually platform coincidentally is built on top of Laravel. Uh, they were the clear winner uh, uh, and had the highest scores consistently with uh, 62, closely, closely fo followed by the Microsoft uh, .NET ecosystem, mainly .NET Core, uh, uh, in in the recent in, in the recent years, and essentially, we have a we have a quote from the founder and CEO of Laravel inside the report. Basically, the best way to describe it is if you know if you're building an API and you have a lot of unexperienced developers, you you want to give them some kind of a constraint. And languages like frameworks like Laravel are purposefully built to put you in a set of constraints, you can't actually go do a very bad API, just very easy. You have to actually put in effort to, to build a, a bad API, uh, unlike maybe in JavaScript where you could just do whatever you want. Uh, and the .NET ecosystem, we've seen that booming even last year, uh, where Microsoft is obviously investing a lot of money generally in developer tooling, especially with the advent of AI, Copilot, co and everything else. And de definitely my favorite uh, one, we, we're able to track industries across uh, across these APIs. So when people create an API or sign up with a company, we actually kind of get some insights about the company itself and we categorize those companies in a couple of different uh, industries, right? And definitely, I would say that... Uh, Who would have thought? Yeah, yeah. Definitely surprise is that consult management consulting industry scores uh, or produces the best APIs uh, uh, in the business followed by IT and finance industry. Again, I think this is pretty much in line with what we also hear with customers uh, because you know financial institutions and the importance of APIs for them is dramatically higher than somebody who's just like you know randomly building APIs and I guess if you're spending money uh, you know consultants are actually uh, apparently worth it or based on the data so we can go to the next key finding <clears throat> yeah the next one kind of the whole team, and I think Harsha briefly talked about the, not just the size of the landscape is getting bigger, but also the APIs are in general getting more and more complex. The number one thing that we measure just to try to real, you know, understand where people are uh, in a, on a scale is the number of a, uh, endpoints an average API has. So essentially every API has, you know, the backbone of every API are endpoints. And on average, uh, that number for an API was 42 endpoints uh, in 2024 compared to 2023 when the average number was just 2022. So basically almost double the amount of endpoints. Uh, and again, we can, you know, in the report, if once you read it, the big theme here is, is gonna be around AI and the complexity that uh, AI brings and the rush that is happening to basically get these, you know, APIs talking to an LLM or some sort of a, an AI thing, uh, uh, and a lot of them are basically just either adding more APIs or adding more endpoints. It's one of those two things, right? Either way, very, very complicated. Not only the number of APIs has grown, but basically 
we grouped APIs, uh, in t we grouped uh, the scale into different uh, uh, kind of groups. So we've got a group below 10 endpoints from 11 to 50 endpoints, 50 uh, to 100 and 100 and above. And the biggest growth happened from uh, 1 to 10 to 11 to 50, where the group grew 35%. So essentially, people went from having really small, tiny, sophisticated APIs, probably running microservices, Again, uh, we can conclude that uh, to having these bigger and more complex APIs that again, then require a lot more kind of nuance and a lot more experience, like Harsha mentioned, to control, manage, uh, and understand. And I've got a question maybe for you. One trend <laughs> <Right>. that I've, <laughs> one trend, I have two questions actually, but one trend I've been seeing is uh, this notion of uh, say uh, centralization versus microservices. So do you think this increasing complexity of APIs and uh, how complex they are getting through every day, do you think this is pushing enterprises or even companies to be more centralized and move away from the microservices? I think, and maybe some of you probably know this better than I do, uh, I think there was at a certain point in time like a microservice craze uh, where everything was a microservice. And again, that, that can work, but it needs requires discipline, right? So you, you really need to know how to share data among those microservices. You really need to know how to efficiently uh, talk to them, cache between these different things. And like I said, uh, most importantly, understand the flows between those. I think for most people, well, my microservices kind of uh, fail to work is that when, when something breaks, it's almost impossible to find where that is in like a connected chain of like, 10 different microservice requests. We do help with that. We do have a traceability feature, but essentially uh, that that has proven to be like a challenge from what we know and hear. And uh, I think it's not a bad thing that people are building more robust APIs. I just think that as, as, as the report will show, not a lot of people know how to build good APIs. Again, I'm sure that everybody in this room knows that and follows a certain set of rules and builds good APIs, but generally, generally, the data that we get uh, isn't as pretty as, as, as I personally would have hoped. Uh, Our favorite topic, zombies. Yeah, yeah. Uh, <laughs> uh, on top of that, uh, uh, like I said, not only are these APIs are getting complex, but we noticed a uh, kind of growth from around, I think, 20, 8% of zombie APIs to 35% zombie MP APIs this year. So what this tells me is, yeah, again, we come back to this discipline thing. Yeah, people grow the number of APIs, but don't they don't sunset the, the endpoints they don't use. Probably because they don't even know uh, that nobody's using them. They have no insights. They have no data. It's very hard for them to get that data, understand that data. Most like, most like Mostly because the, the, guy, the people who are in charge of making those decisions don't have access to that data, right? That data is is you know stored somewhere in some kind of a uh, a logging thing where nobody knows how to, how to get access to that. The last thing that we've noticed is that essentially, and this was similar last year as well, sixty eight percent percent of all requests are GET requests, which essentially means that most of the APIs are built to consume information. Not a lot of them actually are built to do anything with you know create anything new. Uh, we did see an increase uh, uh, where post requests are actually up to 4%. I think last year, uh, maybe that number was 1% or 2% actually of all requests uh, uh, that we follow. So out of a billion requests, again, 4% were post requests, right? Uh, it sounds weird, but that's the reality of how people use APIs. Mostly they consume uh, data. Is there a question? Go ahead. Still puzzled about the, the, the first figure that the uh, number of endpoints uh, average increased from 22 to 43 yeah. endpoints within a year. Yeah. So I'm wondering how much developer power or man uh, man hours are needed to make that increase. It, it seems it's very high. Uh, yes and no. We come back to the previous one with JavaScript uh, guys just building APIs willy nilly, whatever they want and however they want. I agree, but also you're, you're kind of one thing that we've, we've observed and we're going to talk about that later on. A lot of APIs, no, I mean, the next thing is going to be about AI. There's a lot of proxy APIs so or, or a proxy endpoint. What does that mean? 
essentially you just build an endpoint on your API that calls another thing, right? So it's not, it's just an endpoint on your API that basically does nothing for you. It just gets some information and release, release that information and you call it your API, right? <laughs> Uh, uh, go ahead. A, a unique uh, destination on your API, like an, what? Because endpoint, end literally an endpoint. Uh, yeah, like a post endpoint. Like let's say you have a resource called uh, users. Uh, get users would be one endpoint. Post users uh, would be another endpoint. Put users. Another one, let's say, get user slash ID would be another one, et cetera, et cetera. Yeah. I, good thing, okay. I don't think you, I don't think I would say that sending data via get requests uh, would ever be a good pattern. I don't know, maybe, maybe, like just from, from everything that I've read, if you actually want to send some data to the server, right? And let's say you're creating an article, you have an API, or let's say you have a banking API, right? You want to make a transaction, you want to send some amount and a credit card uh, number or last four digits. You, I wouldn't do that over a GET request. I would definitely use a POST request because you're, as, as long as you're creating something new in a database or anywhere in, in some kind of a storage, it could be a file storage, it could be a database, you want to be creating a POST request. GET request has a diff, different dependency and everything uh, uh, than the, the POST request, right? So whenever you call a GET request, you're always expected to get the same thing. But whenever you call a POST request, you're creating something new, right? So the ID is never going to be the same. If you create something right now, it's going to have one ID, five minutes later, another ID, et cetera, et cetera. <laughs> we, I have, uh, we, I've, I've seen, we, we've seen APIs literally that have just get requests. I think that's wonderful, but I don't think that's, uh, again, it's very hard for me to say what's right, what's wrong, because REST is not a standard. I would say if you're creating anything, do post. Uh, you had a question. <laughs> any endpoint, any endpoint, doesn't matter. I really don't care if it's internal. We, we haven't looked whether or not it's internal or, or external. Uh, if you have a new endpoint, uh, we can actually track when the date of creation of that endpoint was. And we've compared the number of endpoints last year to the number of endpoints this year. And just to add to what Vedran said, uh, we talked to Fortune 500 and Global 2000 companies uh, every week. One of the things that we are increasingly seeing is there are teams and people and resources being put into where their job is to reduce the complexity of these uh, increasingly growing endpoints and APIs every single day and they're spending uh, tens of thousands of uh, uh, hundreds of dollars uh, just to decrease this complexity so these endpoints can get simpler for both internal and also external consumption for anyone. Just to finish it off, uh, a question about, uh, uh, a gentleman had a question about the, the number of developers needed to support this. In an ideal world, you would see, uh, and we've seen an increase of engineers getting added to trouble projects. Uh, we can actually go back and try to figure out does that number match? My, my guess is no, <laughs> but uh, because we also serve, you're going to see why in the next slide, but it's an interesting question. I'm going to think about that for next year. Uh, let's go to the next one. <clears throat> so I've said this multiple times, but essentially one, one key finding that I guess you all probably know is the expansion of APIs is being fueled by AI. And we've touched upon this a bit, but essentially in 2023, we started tracking AI-based APIs, right? How do we classify them? First and foremost, uh, it's very simple. Sometimes uh, we check whether or not they have a .ai domain name, right? Uh, or mention AI in their name, number one. But secondly, we actually, like I, like I said, have a spe specific category for 
when you're like creating these APIs in the companies, what, what category you fall into, and AI has been a new one that we added. So we actually saw an 800% increase uh, in AI related or based APIs uh, in the last year, where basically the next closest uh, industry that grew was maximum 10%. So essentially, everything that you've heard, complexity of endpoints, complexity of APIs, the rush to, to publish this APIs, the rush to get more endpoints happens because of this. And again, I think Kin uh, Lane added a quote in the report about the APR sprawl and the bill that we're all gonna <laughs> have to pay because of this. I think at the same time, this is a wonderful thing for everybody in the API industry, obviously, because you know the more <laughs> the more generally the more APIs, the the better it is for for vendors who actually you know uh, provide uh, uh, tools to that. That's for sure. But I think uh, we will, at one point in time, have to rectify a lot of the things that, that we did here, sometimes to experiment, sometimes uh, to, to basically do random stuff and, and forget about it. One, like I said, one, one of these things that we've tracked is, you know, how, how these APIs react and how they're used. And most of these APIs have actually been proxy APIs, where again, we know that based on a combination of different things, everything from load times, response sizes, uh, data that we get about external uh, APIs that they request, that you know, I call an API from an AI company, they call another API and relay the answer. That's basically uh, the gist of what they do, which isn't wrong, but they're not actually building and designing APIs, right? They're essentially relaying information, which again, is fair, but it's something that uh, we should all, all be aware of. The last thing is uh, we have the governance product that essentially checks for, as we mentioned, uh, three different categories, how you design your API, how does the performance look like, and essentially uh, what's the quality like uh, around security. The last category we added is AI readiness, where essentially we've personally tested a bunch of different APIs to try to realize uh, how do you get, how do you build an API that can be easily consumed and understood by uh, by a large language model without you actually needing to 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 you know give it additional information. But if you give it an open API spec file, what does the open API spec need to have? What's the minimum amount of data? And essentially, you found that 50, uh, 52% of all APIs are not AI ready, meaning the documentation that we saw that they have was not up to par of what uh, an LLM model would be easily uh, able to understand, right? And uh, this is something, like I said, uh, we have an AI product that essentially generates uh, code, uh, data models, uh, integration code based on the documentation. So as part of developing that, we actually tested a bunch of different APIs uh, and it's their documentation to try to see what is it that they would miss when we try to generate these things. Let's go to the next one. Your favorite, Harsha. API security, I think it's all our favorite. Uh, this is also an extension from the last year's analysis that we've did. Uh, some of this might be very evident. 52% of requests had no form of authentication at all while 55% of the requests didn't use SSL, TLS encryption, and the average security score was uh, 40 out of 100. Uh, again, like Vedran mentioned before, uh, we look at uh, overall API scoring based on API design, performance, and security, and when we look out of security score, uh, uh, the average score was 40, which is again uh, a very uh, depressing but not alarming uh, uh, from what we see and what we uh, uh, look at every day. Uh, I think this has been an uh, increase, if I'm not wrong, from last year uh, by a few single digit percentages uh, in terms of authentication uh, itself. Uh, and uh, the next one that we have here is 76% of all the requests had a medium threat level uh, score with most of them failing at security at design time. Uh, when we look at security testing uh, inside Trouble, we categorize security between low, medium, and high tests based on 
14 or 15 different API specific security checks that we do, which include almost all the OWASP top 10, plus a few other things that we believe are important for API security. So um, things like SQL injection or IP reputation uh, and a lot more security headers and specifics which we look at and more than 75% of them uh, turned out to be a medium threat level uh, alert, uh, which is also uh, something that we've seen as an increase uh, in last year. I think in one of the recent reports that I uh, read this year on API security, uh, it said that 95% of all production APIs have a security uh, have a security threat, and uh, uh, I think uh, close to 60% have experienced uh, a security breach or a security uh, uh, or a security issue. problem issue. Uh, at uh, some point in the last uh, 12 months, which is also very alarming. And the last one that we have here is 85% of all APIs are not using any form of rate limiting, allowing anyone to perform attacks on their APIs. I think uh, this is something that we've seen increase as more external APIs and public APIs are coming. Uh, as people are trying to put out more external or public APIs, this number is growing uh, exponentially as well. Uh, Basically, like a lot of APIs are very unsecure, right? Uh, and, and sometimes it's really fascinating to see how they fail at the very basic of security. Like we're not talking advanced security threat protections and like I think everybody here buys a lot of software that, that helps them with security, but basically none of that software tells you, hey, you should add a simple header that prevents iframe embedding of your API, which could lead to potential hacks and, and, and exploits and stuff like that, or even like authentication, like imagine, I don't know, you all live in houses and apartments, you all probably have keys uh, to those houses and apartments. I can't just walk in uh, to your house and open the door and like, you know, take something from the fridge, go out and like come in the middle of night. You know, there's a key that stops me. And essentially, you know, I don't, we, I, it's never clear. I mean, there is, we hear explanations and basically the explanation to all uh, security kind of issues is, these APIs are internal, right? So nobody knows about them, right? Uh, and uh, which is valid, right? Especially like my favorite one is the T uh, HTTPS uh, kind of encryption. Like I remember like when, 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 we, when I started building APIs professionally or, or working, it was like 2011, you had to pay like, I don't know, 2K or 3K for an SSL certificate. Uh, uh, per year now, like it's free and people still don't use it, right? And it simply encrypts uh, uh, the communication to a point where it's much harder to basically decrypt anything, especially if you're in a regulated industry, telecom, financial institutions, et cetera, et cetera. So, uh, and always the justification when we go ask and when we talk to customers that have an F and are in disbelief that this is an F, uh, you know, the explanation from engineers is, oh, it was supposed to be an internal API it got converted to a partner API and now it's a public API, you know? Uh, so it is what it is, right? But I think the conclusion uh, that we can, that we wanted to kind of draw from all of these uh, findings is basically we still, you know, there's going to be a, a continued explosion of, of API usage in, in 2025. All of you are going to build more APIs, more complex APIs. They're going to do a lot more stuff than they used to do and people are going to start noticing uh, the APIs unlike most of the time where nobody even knows uh, about this stuff, but they're going to go, I would say from the shadows, much more closer to the surface and, you know, the quality uh, and amongst other things like performance security is actually going to be one of those dis differentiating factors uh, uh, that I think will matter. I think uh, the web was in a similar, I would compare the state of APIs today to the state of web circa, let's say 2014, 15, when, where basically everybody was building websites because it was you know cool and, and people knew how to do it. But most of those web websites were very slow, very uh, uh, unsecure and not optimized. So Google stepped in, kind of developed a bunch of tooling uh, and did uh, absolutely everything else uh, to kind of uh, to kind of prevent that. So. The report, uh, you, want, you wanted to say something? No, when you said about, uh, when you spoken about uh, what your customers talk to you about, uh, I think one of the things I hear the most is, this is not my job. 
uh, securing the API. That's what I hear from developers. They say there's a security team, and when this goes to evaluation, they'll figure it out and they'll flag it. And this is not coming from an individual developer or startup. This is coming from uh, all the enterprises that we speak to. So they think it's not their job, and uh, they are in disbelief that unless someone tells me to do it, uh, it's not my job to make sure the API is secure. So, uh, I mean, we've all heard about shift left. Uh, that is never happening. <laughs> so I think uh, we need to really shift give left. <laughs> uh, shift left. And uh, I think uh, give developers uh, the right tooling. Uh, obviously, there are a lot of tools, uh, but I think still there is a lot of scope for giving them the right tooling at the right point uh, to help them shift left. Uh, yeah. So the report, Harsha can open up the page. The report is going to be available uh, right now. Uh, it is actually available on report.treble.com. We've got this uh, really cool website. It's a simple website. You can download the report uh, without basically uh, any email required uh, because we already have it. Uh, so, so thank you for that. <laughs> uh, all jokes aside, uh, you can just click on the download report button. You'll get a PDF. Uh, there are basically there's 30 pages of raw data uh, we've di digested everything uh, in like these five key points we've got quotes from again a bunch of uh, uh, people from the industry and even from this room including Sudeep uh, the the CEO of Traffic Labs uh, Taylor Otwell the CEO of Laravel uh, 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 Ado Trakic the the API architect at uh, Capital One and a bunch of other uh, uh, industry folks uh, on the report so you can actually see and read what they're thinking about the future of APIs, how they're building it, how they're uh, going about that, uh, and that's about it. So thanks so much. And again, if anybody has questions, I'd be more than happy to answer them now or, or later.